Hi everybody, my name is Michaela Martin and I'm here with my co-host Ivan Beck. Hi guys. Today we're going to be talking about a very important conservation topic centered around the black-footed ferret. That's right. Black-footed ferrets are a wonderful species and we're very excited to share with you their history and the wonderful efforts going into their conservation. Alright Michaela, how about you tell us a little bit about our friend who we're discussing today. Sure thing Ivan. The black-footed ferret's scientific name is Mustela nigripus, with nigripus meaning black-footed in Latin. There are only about 300 of them currently living in the wild, and this population is a mix of wild and captive form. This is because in 1979, the black-footed ferret was declared extinct. But fortunately, in 1981, a small population was found in the wild prairies of Wyoming. A few years later, in 1987, conservationists were able to catch the last 24 ferrets and start the captive breeding program. It took a few years, but in 1991, the first captive bred ferrets were released into the wild. Conservationists have made reintroduction attempts for the black-footed ferret across eight states in the U.S. at 29 different sites. Their historic range reaches from Canada all the way down to Mexico throughout the Great Plains. Their habitat consists mostly of prairie and grasslands and are incredibly tied to their food supply. Their main source of food are prairie dogs. Not only are they the ferret's main source of food, but they also live in vacated prairie dog holes. Resourceful little guys, huh? Oh yeah, I heard about that. They really are tied to their food supply. <laughs> I read from the National Park Service that prairie dogs are about 90% of the ferret's diet. I think one ferret can eat something like 100 prairie dogs per year. Oh yeah, I don't doubt it. I read a paper from the Biological Conservation Journal about the black-footed ferret. Their success where they are transplanted and reintroduced to a new location is heavily influenced by the population and distribution of prairie dogs. Based on what we talked about earlier, I think we can see why this is such a big factor for their survival. Wow. Prairie dogs are really important for these guys. The black-footed ferret population fell apart largely due to the change in prairie dog populations and their dynamics. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Ivan? There are so many reasons that these guys struggle in the wild. One of the big reasons that's also causing a lot of difficulty for the reintroduced populations today is the sylvatic plague, a terrible disease that infects their primary food source and can be transferred onto them. Conservationists had a lot of problems dealing with this back in 2008 at the Kanata Basin. It's contracted by prairie dogs through fleas and is transmitted to the black-footed ferret by consumption of the prairie dogs and it is highly deadly to them. Oh wow, that's awful. Isn't the Kanata Basin where most of the wild black-footed ferret populations live? It is, specifically in the Badlands National Park. It wasn't without struggle, though. There was a huge outbreak in the early 2000s that needed a lot of remediation to keep the population alive. I heard about that. I heard that they had treatments for the black-footed ferrets they were using to improve their survival. A peanut butter-flavored vaccine to limit the spread of the virus? Yeah, it's definitely a limiting factor for the reintroduced populations but conservationists have been using those techniques to limit spread. Another thing they decided to do was to dust prairie dog holes with insecticides to try and restrict the fleas from spreading the virus. These ferrets have more than the virus to worry about though. Another reason that they initially went extinct was because their food source, the prairie dogs, were being intentionally exterminated. Farmers in the area see them as an agricultural pest and use things like rat poison to limit their presence near the farms, which would then spread to the black-footed ferrets. Well, seeing how closely these two species are intertwined, it makes sense that the loss of prairie dogs would affect the ferrets. Yeah, that's common with many endangered species. Prime habitat for them to live in is also prime habitat for agriculture, which isn't unique to just this species. Another example would be wolves. Well, human development is a huge pressure on native habitats that creatures the black-footed ferret call home. Development in these areas, which include housing, agriculture, and human recreation, all make the survival of these species far more difficult. So Ivan, what other factors do you know about that might be affecting the black-footed ferret's food supply? Well, one study showed that prairie dog populations are heavily affected based on weather patterns from the previous year such as the amount of rainfall and how long winters lasted in their habitat, which showed that heavy rainfall and unusually long winters are a factor for whether or not it's a good year for them reproduction-wise, which would be terrible due to the black-footed ferret's main food supply being prairie dogs. 
Sounds like their populations are sensitive to a changing climate as well, which isn't very good news due to the severe impact climate change is having on the world right now. Now that we've talked about their food supply, let's talk about how these populations are affected by such a small size. Oh yeah? What about these populations, Ivan? Well, first off, seeing how there are about only 300 wild black-footed ferrets left, they're subject to inbreeding and the terrible side effects of that. One of the main effects of inbreeding in populations correlates to not only a lower fitness for the individual animal, but a decrease in litter size and fitness for their population as a whole. Another aspect to inbreeding is that it doesn't provide enough genetic variation and causes a buildup of deleterious mutations and duplicate alleles that increase their susceptibility to disease. That's no good. It sounds like their already small population size is going to lead to a, their population getting smaller and smaller over time. But a new scientific technique is currently being explored to address this issue. That's right. Scientists are currently working on a new and fascinating technique called conservation cloning to reintroduce extant genetics to the modern-day black-footed ferret populations. That's right. The technique that the scientists at the American Genetic Association had proposed would be to use stored genetic information from a preserved black-footed ferret specimen and implant somatic cells from that specimen into a domestic ferret oocyte, which is a cell in the ovaries which would soon form the ovum, which will inevitably become a fully formed black-footed ferret embryo, which can be implanted in the surrogate domesticated ferret mother, allowing for the cloning of a deceased member of the population and reintroduction of those lost genes. Weren't they successful in cloning one specimen? Yes, they were. They had successfully cloned one female member of the species that they had found back in the 80s, and they had named her Elizabeth Ann. Wow, that's amazing. Inbreeding of these ferrets has caused some real problems in their physical anatomy, such as kinked tails and deformed sternums, which is not good for their ability to survive in the wild. Increasing genetic diversity in a species gene pool is incredibly important to the health and stability of the population. Having a more combinations of alleles available for reproduction does so many things, such as decrease the risk of negative recessive genes becoming prominent in the gene pool. This is also helpful for alleles to mix into the population, promoting better fitness, leading to a more stable wild communities and may allow them to become more resilient to the Slavonic plague. This can help increase the ferret's ability to survive without the conservator's intervention. The final hope of this project is that the ferrets can become self-sustaining and get these guys to a point where they can survive and thrive on their own. Which is happening at a slow and steady pace thanks to the wonderful conservation efforts and captive breeding programs of six institutions, one federal and five zoos. All of them are under the supervision of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, which are aiding in the increase in, albeit slowly, population. Black-footed ferrets are not only important for maintaining their ecosystem, but they are also a flagship species, which is a species that helps in the conservation of that ecosystem by engaging the public and raising awareness and conservation efforts for prairie lands as a whole, which hosts a multitude of animals and plants, many of which are in decline due to the spread of agriculture and urbanization. That's right. According to the Nature Conservancy, the North American prairie lands are home to over 130 plant and animal species. The final topic we'd like to discuss today is where black-footed ferrets currently stand in relation to where they should be to remain stable, as well as some other factors inhibiting their survival. That's right. According to the National Park Service, black-footed ferrets need their population to be around 3,000 in, in order to be considered fully recovered which is a frightening figure in the face of the current population of 300. Some more things inhibiting their survival are natural predators, such as bobcats, coyotes, badgers, and predatory birds, which are especially bad on these populations due to captive bred animals having worse survival instincts compared to those born in the wild. Well, we are happy to have shared this information with you, and I hope you got something out of this. Black-footed ferrets are wonderful species that contribute to the beauty and wonder of the natural world, as well as play a key role in keeping the balance in their ecosystems, mostly by maintaining prairie dog populations. With how busy everybody is, it is so easy to forget that things are happening outside of the human world and out in nature, but it's good to remember how delicate many ecosystems really are 
and how changes in the ecosystems can have long-lasting destructive effects on delicate plant and animal communities. I agree 100% Michaela. It is important to remember how interconnected the world is and try to do the best we can to preserve our planet. Thank you all very much for listening and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.